by King Hunter, and King Hunter was playing with the black pieces. And let's begin. And quite an interesting choice here on move two by white, a3. Okay, and you do just develop naturally. That's all very normal. Bishop takes f6, another dubious decision, I would say, by white. And here, now your opponent spent this move a3, which is not a development move, right? It's a pawn move. And you are already a little bit ahead in the development. So what you need to do is attack the center and go c5 here. It makes also a lot of sense with your bishop on f6 and white is immediately under pressure. Um, after d takes c5, you can of course take on c3 and destroy the white pawn structure. And if white plays e3, you can take on d4 and, and bring the knight out and you put a lot of pressure on the uh, white center. So this was a way to directly uh, punish white for his opening play and take the initiative for c5. Okay, b6 is a natural move, of course, but now the position is, is fairly normal again. Knight d7, castle, h6. h6, I'm not sure what you want to accomplish with this move. Um, because you're not creating space for your king, right? I mean, the bishop is still pointing at h7. Um, and you're also weakening your king a little bit. I mean, it's not really... It's not really a big deal, but it would have been much more natural to play g6. You can also see how this better harmonizes with the bishop, right? The bishop is covering the dark squares and the pawns are covering the light squares. So you always want to make sure that you have the synergy that the two uh, bishop and pawn, they are working together and complementing each other. Especially here because white will have a hard time exchanging this bishop as he is not having a dark squared bishop anymore. So g6, definitely uh, the more natural move here to play. Okay, let's keep going. c6, rook a c1. And now queen e7. It feels like it's the turn for the queen to move, right? And the queen can't go to c7 because of this pin, and the white could take the pawn d5. So you play to e7, connecting the rooks, and that's what we learn, right? And develop your pieces, connect the rooks, and so on. But the problem is that the queen is in the e-file. And what happens now, white plays rook e1, e4, and your queen has to move again. So instead, you could have played rook e8 first maybe and keep the queen on d8 for now you could have also played something like g6 but i think rook e8 makes sense because this is i mean white has two plans here the one plan is this typical minority attack, moving the queen and then playing something like b4, b5. The other plan is to open up the center of e4. So you want to be prepared for these plans. Actually, white could still go e4 here, but now it's not that bad because now you can put the queen on c7. And yes, white is a little bit better after, let's say, knight takes f6 and putting a knight on e5, but it's not really too bad here. Whereas after queen e7 is already becoming more uncomfortable. Now e4 is looming and is coming actually here. And you see how you made uh, three queen moves out of your last four moves. So that's not optimal as your rooks are not in the game yet. Now takes f6. 
Now you take with the knight, uh, but I think queen takes f6 would have been stronger, not to allow this knight to get to e5, where it's really well placed, very active, pointing at f7 and c6, and uh, just exerting a lot of pressure on your position. <clears throat> and here actually 95 would have been quite strong it's also kind of shutting out the, the black queen not allowing the queen to return threatening knight g6 as well as uh, just all kinds of nasty things here maybe not so much knight takes c6 but bishop c4 is also in the air and the important point is that after queen takes d4 white can just calmly play rook c cd1 and the queen is lacking good squares. Queen f4, queen h4 run into knight g6. And queen c5 can be answered with bishop c4. You can see that all the white pieces are doing something. And the pressure on f7 is a little bit too much. And um, the pawn will drop. And white has a clear advantage. Knight d5 fails due to knight d7, four king, queen and rook. So, g3, white missed that opportunity, queen d6, bishop c4, knight d5, and now you have consolidated again. And white actually goes into this endgame here, which is interesting, but uh, you do have enough play here, and you do everything correctly uh, in the next moves. Claiming the c-file and getting counterplays. Check. Bishop a6. That's all great. But now we're entering the next critical phase. So you see that white also has activated his piece and he looks quite threatening. But it's not too bad and the, the, the light squares also weakened so you can make use of that. Bishop f1 check doesn't accomplish much here. It's... Uh, it's only helping white at this point. So you want to ask yourself, does this check help me or does it help my opponent? And especially here, you can always play this check later, right? So if you had played f6 first, uh, white would have a problem, in fact. You actually, you're better here. Um, Notice now, if white takes on a7, then you give to check and pick up a piece. So that's not possible. Knight g6 is what your opponent played in the game with the bishop on f1, the king on f3. If knight g4, we'll get to knight g6 in a moment, you can just go after this pawn and knight on g4 looks stupid. I mean, of course, this is still fairly complicated but looks like you have better chance here after knight g6 now we see the difference now instead of giving a check which would transpose to the, the game you can go bishop d3 and what's different here is that you have this additional option bishop e4 check when the king is under pressure for example now knight f4 Bishop e4 check, f3 can be answered with rook c2, but actually white needs to play f3 because of the king h3, rook g1. He has an even bigger problem due to threats such as bishop f5 check and g5. Um, and white is actually just losing here already because of the attack against the king. So um, this is important to note. If knight e2 now, can give a check, king h4, and I'll play rook g2. And um, it's not looking good for white. Rook h2, knight f4 is g5, picking up a piece, and knight g1. 
Now G1 is maybe still hanging on. But this all feels really, really, really close to being over. And probably there's, there's a direct win somewhere here. Because here's still white has G4. But even something like this, even something like this looks absolutely terrible for white. I might be just straight up winning now. Okay, but we, we got too far here. Okay, this is this is again winning. Um, in either case, the point is that this check that you gave on F1 did only help your opponent, didn't help you. right? And especially if you have this option to give the check later, then why not give it later, maybe. Okay, bishop with one check. King f3, f6, knight g6. Here we see the difference. If you now play bishop d3, now the king can kind of escape, right? It just goes to uh, e3. Still, you should have done that because here you can just keep poking at the pawns and um, this is equal. Okay, rook b1. Here what could have just taken on a7 but and then play knight e7, knight takes d5, but he missed that. He went knight f4. And now this is the this is the last quick moment in the game. Uh, here you need to play precisely to hold the balance. Mm. Rook takes b2 was necessary. Now if white takes on d5, you can go rook d2, and that's equal. So the critical move must be knight e6, but uh, here you have rook e2, pinning the knight on e6, and after rook g7, king h8, white needs to play knight f4. If he goes rook e7, you can go rook e4, and white is just not getting out of this pin and actually black is better here so uh, that's important you have this passed pawn which can be a crucial can be a crucial factor i mean let's say white decides to to exchange rooks now in this end game you're better because you have this passed pawn and knights hate passed pawns um, so you have the better chance here. All right. So white in this position would need to play knight f4 that immediately. The difference is now that you kind of you have your b bishop stuck on f1. So the best you can do is go into this pawn end game which turns out to be equal. Okay. So this was the way to go to equalize rook takes b2. Because after bishop c4, knight e6, the white forces are just too strong. Um, you play rook takes b2 now, but the problem is that your king is so passive and stuck on the last rank. Yeah, if you now play rook e1 with the same idea to pin the, the knight on the e-file, the problem is that uh, white will just do the same thing, but the difference is that this time white has a pawn on b2, and it's just a clear pawn up and winning. You don't have this pass pawn anymore. The best try was to go g5, but this is also losing, I'm pretty sure, because the king is coming in. Now we see another disadvantage. You play bishop one check, and you uh, help your opponent to get his king a little bit more active. 
you didn't have any benefit from this bishop of one check and here it is quite cute actually bishop f5 um, and now g4 bishop takes e6 and king g6 very nice move if uh, rook takes e6 king f7 black is holding on because king is getting off the eighth rank but king g6 is stopping that threatening mate so king f8 is forced and now rook takes e6 and i don't think this this rook end game can be saved but it was the best chance because in the game it's an it's easy play for white just takes on g7 takes on a7 the pawns are still equal but the main difference is the king activity you see the king coming in here and there's nothing what is stopping this king you see all the white pieces are active and your pieces are kind of far away from the action you don't have much counter play the b pawn is too far back so this is game over and checkmate coming very soon All right, let me check the chat. Okay, I didn't make any comments about the game. Um, so let me summarize. So in the opening, you had the chance to take the initiative right away with this move C5. And especially if you look at his moves, right, he gives up his bishop, he plays a3, plays a pawn with another piece development move, then you maybe already get a sense there might be some something possible. And usually the way to punish your opponent's slow play, I guess, in the opening, if he's undeveloped, is to open up the center in some way, attack the center. And that's what you could have done with c5. Then later on we get this close position. Um, like I said, h6 was a little bit strange to me because it doesn't really improve your position instead g6 would have been better and uh, then this queen e7 led to some trouble because you didn't anticipate what your opponent was going to do next um, opening up the e file of playing e4 and then your queen was just misplaced you fought back got into his endgame which was equal and then I think it came down to a lot about maybe calculation. I mean, this was a lot of those lines were really concrete. So um, it's necessary to calculate a lot, but also some decisions could have been made on general terms. Like, you know, I'm coming back to this with Bishop F1 check move where you're just helping your opponent. You're not getting anything from this move. Um, so you could have. Uh, decided that on general terms that doesn't help you yeah I think the end game was all about calculation really I mean the, the, the several critical moments you saw there was about really figuring out does this work for me uh, is white getting a strong enough attack or not do I have enough counterplay and um, yeah I mean you maybe also didn't sense the danger of the the white king coming in possibly uh, it seems you did not uh, really appreciate the activity of the white king or that could be really dangerous okay so what I'd recommend you to do would be also to do more calculation exercises and also maybe maybe some endgame book could be helpful as well i feel like um let me think what is a good endgame book to start well people always mention the, the endgame manual by doretsky that's not bad uh I recently read 100 Endgames You Must Know. I think that's a really good starting point because it deals with all those theoretical endgames. And then there's also 
a lot of great stuff from Carsten Müller, who's considered one of the greatest endgame experts in the world. He has published a 14 uh, DVD series on endgames and uh, he has also published a lot of good books on endgames. Um, so you might want to look into this. I know actually you've gotten one on endgames you must know recently, so you can let me know.